the most prominent statement that is cited is when Yusuf Hamid, the head of CIPLA at the time, he says he'll supply a year's supply of antiretroviral drugs for $300 a year. And at the time, they'd been about $10,000 a year in cost. Antiretrovirals had been available to people in higher income countries, but not in lower and middle income countries. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. One of the many ways in which India has expanded its influence in global affairs relates to pharmaceutical products. The Indian pharmaceutical sector has enthusiastically highlighted its ability to develop AAA technology that is affordable, available, and adaptable. By encouraging research hubs and offering a steady supply of affordable drugs to many countries, including the United States, India has rapidly moved from being a pharmacy for low-income countries to becoming the pharmacy of the world. The country's rapidly growing economy has been a major beneficiary of the astonishing rise of the domestic pharmaceutical industry. In becoming a powerhouse on low-cost generic drugs, India contributes actively to meeting global demands for vaccines, over-the-counter medicines and patented drugs. An important factor that has contributed to enhancing the reputation and profitability of Indian pharmaceutical companies abroad has been the government's tough policy on patents, which has enabled Indian firms to manufacture generic versions of drugs that are much more expensive in countries where they were originally developed. But Indian companies also face numerous challenges in the export market. There is a growing demand to reduce costs even further. And several countries in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia are trying to protect and promote their domestic industries by introducing new regulations that make Indian imports more expensive. There are also concerns that India has become increasingly dependent on imports from China for so-called active pharmaceutical ingredients that are required for making both advanced and essential medicines. To discuss India's huge and thriving pharmaceutical industry and the country's ability to supply affordable vaccines and generic drugs to low-income countries, I am joined by Rory Horner. Rory is a senior lecturer in globalization and political economy in the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. We began by discussing the role and impact of the pharmaceutical industry in global development. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Great to have you on the show, Rory. Welcome. Thanks, Dan. Good to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Well, I've been following your work for many years, and I'm really glad to have this chance to speak with you, Rory. You and others have, over the years, been observing that the pharmaceutical industry, of course, does not necessarily feature as prominently in the academic and policy discourse as, say, many other industries. It could be extractive industries or you know, textiles, as you've written about. The argument has been by you and others that pharmaceuticals are actually important in the global south. They do create lots of jobs. They, they are important for export revenues for countries such as India and China and many others. And of late, of course, there's been a lot of focus on the, the ability of countries like India to produce affordable medicines that are not just crucial for consumption within India and other countries, but also important in terms of making them available for export to countries where people can't afford the more expensive Western alternatives. So my question is, do you think COVID has changed things now? Do you see more interest in better understanding the really crucial role 
that pharmaceuticals in low and medium income countries play in global development? I think that's a a hundred percent yes to, to that question. I think COVID has really generated increased uh, awareness of what the relevance of pharmaceuticals and whether it's medicines or or vaccines are, and including having production capabilities to produce uh, key medicines and vaccines. It's the amount of conversations that I've had with colleagues and other people in in recent months that are suddenly people are interested in in uh, vaccines, which which countries are producing them, wh- who that which regulators are going to approve them, which countries have agreements to buy which vaccines, which drugs in the early stages of the pandemic there was a lot of interest in different drugs, whether remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, dexamethasone. So th- there's there's in a sense almost unprecedented interest in in pharmaceuticals and realizing how unbelievably important pharmaceutical industry is for, in this case, for global public health and by consequence, the global economy. But as you said, the pharmaceutical industry in development studies or in broader work on the political economy of development has never really attracted anywhere near as much attention as many other industries. The textile industry attracts a lot of attention as a potential sort of springboard to industrialization. Auto industry is a more advanced industry in some lower middle income country, middle income countries, and also, of course, many agricultural industries, given and natural resource based industries, given their prominence in in many countries. So it's been remarkable how, to me, how few people, in a sense, are researching the pharmaceutical industry pre the pandemic, at least in what we typically think of as a development studies community. And there are people spread out across different disciplines doing doing really great work, but it, it's not as it's it's in a way not been recognized as central a way. In in policy making, there are various agendas which have attracted a lot of attention. So immediately once I say I do work in pharmaceuticals, many people will be like, okay, intellectual property rights. And there's been enormous interest and awareness of the hugely contentious debates over intellectual property rights, uh, and particularly in relation to the World Trade Organization trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights agreement, which was a condition of for all countries of as a, to be a member of the WTO. And the pharmaceutical industry was absolutely central to those debates. Uh, and India was really crucial there too, because India had developed a successful, very prominent pharmaceutical industry with r- relatively limited patent protection. So there are areas where it sort of has filtered in the past onto wider horizons, especially through the IP issue. But I think the pandemic has really thrown a much greater light and much more people are now interested in the pharmaceutical industry and and its relevance in multiple different ways in the global south as well as the global north of course why is it rory that there wasn't much interest before before covid everything you've just said shows that pharmaceuticals of course are extremely important in large parts of the world it is not just uh, the availability it's also the affordability issue. And so I find it surprising that this sector has been neglected. Why is it that it has been neglected for so long until COVID came along? I, mean, I think there might be a couple of things. I mean, I mean, it's, it's obviously not been completely neglected. There was work on, for example, dependent development where, I mean, Peter Evans, an incredibly well-known uh, economic sociologist, he, he worked on pharmaceuticals in Brazil in that context. And Gary Jureffi, who actually wrote a book on dependency and the pharmaceutical industry in the third world as at the very beginning of his career before he developed all of his work on global value chains. He did a lot of his early work on the pharmaceutical industry in Mexico. So there was some really prominent development scholars who who have done work on pharmaceuticals, but it, it never was really a kind of, it, and, and it, my experience has been if you, if you submit a, a paper on, ph- you have to organize your own session for a conference on pharmaceuticals and really recruit people that you know are working in this area from other disciplines to, to come because you just, there's not anywhere near the kind of critical mass of people working in pharmaceuticals as elsewhere. I think, I mean, there's, there, it's partly related to this perhaps 
unofficial sort of division of labor between work on global health and work on what we would now call global development as well, where health, there, there is a sort of whole separate group of, well, there, there, there's overlaps in some fora when people come together, but there are, I mean, people in global health who work on other aspects of pharmaceutical. So it, it's it's hard to know. It, it's, it definitely seems somewhat related to a bit of an intellectual division of labor. Maybe it's just, it's not been seen in, in many countries as just not attracted the same recognition. It, it's not probably the same sector with the same likely kind of job creation potential or industrial spillovers as some other industries may create as well. I think a lot of the significance of the industry does come from its the fact that it's an industry with public health implications. And that may be a factor in it's not accounting for the same volume of employment or export share as natural resource industries would in even in countries where pharma industry is very successful. And it's also, it, it's very hard for me to answer because I've also been, I've always been relatively convinced of the significance of pharmaceuticals. And especially that's the case when you going out and doing field work and talking to people in pharmaceutical firms and policy makers and places where there's, I mean, there's just huge debates over pharmaceuticals and and their their development implications, both on the industry and the health side. So, at least in the academic discourse, if I understand this correctly, the the discourse on the pharmaceutical industry in the global south, particularly say in the seventies and eighties, there was a lot of focus on trying to understand the development of this industry in relation to the debates of that time on dependency. That a lot of developing countries were highly dependent on the major developed countries and and it was all about reducing that dependency right and i find it quite fascinating how the pendulum has shifted because what covid did illustrate last year was that there was suddenly this this fear in europe and in the united states that these countries had suddenly become very dependent on the global south for all of these protective equipment from china and 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 there was this request by Donald Trump uh, for India, or it was actually almost a threat to send hydroxychloroquine to, to the U.S. So so it appears that that uh, dependency issue has actually changed somewhat in, from from the global south being dependent on the global north. Now it looks almost the uh, uh, you know the opposite situation, and and there are all of these uh, fears in the global north that one really should not be outsourcing the manufacture of a lot of these essential equipment to other countries, that one should actually um, promote local production. Um, how do you see this, this pendulum shift? I mean, is it is it from the one end to the other? Is it going to come back in terms of you know the production uh, being moved to the global north? I think this is a really fascinating issue and especially linking up to the whole body of work on on dependency theory which in i mean it's there are there are people working on reviving interest in it at the moment but it's it's obviously not a mainstream approach in in development studies but what is and 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 what's really remarkable though is as you say there are basically statements by political leaders in Europe and the United States through various stages of 2020 which are basically making dependency arguments that they and but framing themselves as the periphery dependent on in a sense the core of the pharmaceutical industry or personal protective equipment or in in china and to to some degree in india as well and europe issued a a plan in late november for what is now framed as promoting greater strategic autonomy in the pharmaceutical industry and Donald Trump in May announced a more than $300 million investment in Flowcorp, a company in Virginia, to try and produce some active pharmaceutical ingredients more in America. Similarly, there was a big investment announcement in for Kodak in Rochester, New York State. So there's been this whole idea of now promoting greater local pharmaceutical production in Europe and North America uh, has attracted attention. It's not just pharmaceuticals or medicines. It also relates to 
aspects of other medical industries too. So, I mean, the part of the context behind this is in pharmaceuticals, a huge portion of the active pharmaceutical ingredients, which is the key incipient in a drug, which in a sense has the key functioning to try and make you better when you take it as a medicine. Most of that production in the world is concentrated in in China. It's a very chemical intensive process. It's also quite pollution intensive. And there's been a globalization of the API stage of the pharmaceutical value chain over the last, well, th almost three decades now. Uh, there's been awareness about this dependence actually before the pandemic and including uh, different almost sort of government investigations in America and framing this as a potential national security or health security issue of health security. The pandemic, of course, played up and had a massive influence in amplifying these fears. I think it's noticeable that at least in pharmaceuticals, China's exports would have been some degree affected by the lockdowns in China in the early part of 2020, but there was never any official ban that I am aware of on actually preventing the exports of pharmaceuticals from China. India very temporarily put a ban on some APIs and formulations made in those APIs, but as you said, put faced immediate diplomatic pressure from Donald Trump, most prominently, as well as other countries, and very quickly promised, and especially in cases of humanitarian need and in for lower income countries and places where there was already promises to supply these drugs that they would continue. But these sort of media reports, which then emerge about India preventing pharmaceutical exports, there was media reports last week very temporarily about India's uh, preventing the exports of its newly approved COVID-19 vaccines. In a sense, that was based on confusion about some of the announcements that have taken place. They're still largely the regulatory approvals for those exports of COVID vaccines are still waiting for. But there, there is this sort of whole, in the context of current global tension and America-China tension, there's a whole much greater awareness of this, in a sense, pharmaceutical dependency. And local production is now an agenda. It's not new in the world as a policy agenda because many countries in sub-Saharan Africa over the last 15 years, the African Union has had a, a policy goal of promoting greater local pharmaceutical production because that continent is the, the most dependent on imports of pharmaceuticals anywhere in the world. India has its own agenda around it's become increasingly reliant on China for the active pharmaceutical ingredients. So even though India is known as the pharmacy of the world and a huge exporter of generic medicines, it's more specialized in the formulation stage of the industry where an, an API is then uh, turned into a, a, a liquid, a tablet, a capsule, the common forms in which we would consume drugs. So even though India exports a huge amount of drugs, it, it relies itself on a lot of ingredients coming from China. So in the last couple of years, even before the pandemic, India itself also had uh, a government investigation about how to try and reduce its dependence on China for APIs and made some announcements around industrial parks in March this year to try and promote that agenda further. I think it's a huge question to what extent initiatives to reduce, in a sense, dependency on China or to some extent India will succeed. I mean, that's been actually a question that goes back to dependency and is issues of overcoming dependency in the political economy of development for many decades is it's, it's easier to identify situations of dependency than to actually in practice to overcome them. And it's of course a very popular issue at the moment in the Europe and, um, and America to say we will try and overcome dependency, but this will need long-term su long support in order to do so. And there may also be trade-offs that it uh, may, if potentially increase the cost of of medicines and therefore potentially actually have negative public health consequences, even if there is somewhat of a greater health security. So there, there are various uh, pros and cons that would need to be weighed up and a lot of questions about will politicians and, and policy makers continue to try and support or this industry, or will they just make sort of short-term announcements in the context of the current global emergency?
That's fascinating because the pharmaceutical industry is a great example of the not just being the the China US rivalry but it's also the India China tensions that have created a certain challenges. So perhaps this is the time we should move on to discussing more explicitly the Indian case as you've mentioned is often referred to as the world's pharmacy considered by many to be a pharmaceutical superpower, if I can say so. And the interesting question I, I have for you, at least I think it's an interesting question, is how on earth did India achieve the status of becoming the world's pharmacy? And what really are the main factors that have contributed to this impressive development of all of these big, major pharmaceutical companies in India that are now almost household names in, in many African countries, in large parts of the world. Many African governments are partnering with Indian companies. There are all of these generic drugs being sold. There's a lot of focus on medical tourism to India. So, so before we talk about India's kind of role in the world, my first question really has to do with how did India become this superpower in the pharmaceutical sector? You're, you're absolutely right. India is known as the, the pharmacy of, well, some, some say the developing world, but increasingly people to say pharmacy of the world for its huge generic pharmaceutical industry. And this is something that has been built up over decades. It's not something that has come in the last 20 years. It's not even something that has come post India's liberalization in 1991, there's a key initial policy development that many point to is India's 1970 Patent Act, which removed patents on pharmaceutical products and, and only put very limited uh, process patents in place in, in India. So there was very limited patent protection from 1970 onwards. It's, it's, it's interesting that this was actually even identified in the years leading up to planning for Indian independence that the, the, there'd been a strong patent protection in place in India from the colonial period, from the, the British time, from 1911. There, there, and the various committees, pharmaceutical inquiry committee in 1950s identified the need to sort of to, to limit pat, the amount of patent protection in India in order to facilitate the, the development of a local pharmaceutical industry. But Many other countries had limited patent protection and actually moved to have limited patent protection in the 1960s and 1970s, and but did not develop anywhere near as significant a pharmaceutical industry as India. So we we have to look at other factors in conjunction with the limited patent protection in order to explain the rise of India's pharmaceutical industry. And I think what's really key is there were strong domestic capabilities developed in the 1950s and 1960s, two state-owned companies, Hindustan Antibiotics and Indian Drugs and Pharmaceuticals Limited. The latter IDPL in short, set up in Hyderabad. Hyderabad eventually became a really big center for pharmaceuticals. These state-owned companies, their significance is not really what they achieved in their own identities, but they acted as a development of skills and capabilities, and many people got initial training and experience in these companies who then went on to set up their own private companies. The government companies, in a sense, in Indian government terminology, were declared as uh, sick, uh, essentially uh, financially unviable. But the most prominent example would be Dr. Reddy of Dr. Reddy's Laboratories. Dr. Angie Reddy had uh, worked for Ind uh, Indian Drugs and Pharmaceuticals Limited in Hyderabad at, at, at an earlier stage before he eventually set up Dr. Reddy's Laboratories, which is one of the top three, I think, a lot, uh, Indian pharmaceutical firms in the world. There was also heavy restrictions on foreign investment in the 1970s and, in a sense, a compulsion for multinationals if they wanted to sell in the Indian domestic market that they needed to have some extent of local production present. So some uh, multinationals exited the, the sort of domestic market and then that gave greater space for domestic uh, domestically owned companies to sell within their own country. Other multinationals in a sense partnered with local firms too. So I think we really have to think not just of 
the patent law, which is incredibly, it is incredibly significant in the pharmaceutical industry because once a drug has, it's it's the industry of all industries where IP is the most significant because once a drug is invented in one part part of the world, it can actually be relatively easily reverse engineered. So, so there's examples of certain drugs in India, ibuprofen, for example, in the 1970s, it was, uh, and within a few months, some of these drugs would actually be made available in India, reverse engineered and off patent uh, version. And that was perfectly legal in India at the time. And so, so it, patents is crucial, but we also need to pay attention, I think, to the development of domestic capabilities the scientific uh, skills and the restrictions in foreign investment, which really curbed the multinationals or dislodged the multinationals from the heavy control they had of this industry in India and many other countries in the 1970s and 1980s, or, or prior in the 1950s and 1960s, the multinationals are dislodged. And in a sense, India actually moves from a dependent situation to actually overcoming dependency and starting to play a much more of a lead role in the generic side of this industry in the world. You make a very important point here, Rory, that there were actually many countries that removed these product patents, and, and they've done so in the past few decades, but they haven't been able to develop the kind of domestic pharmaceutical industry to a similar degree as India. And, and the role of the state and domestic institutions, as you rightly point out, have been crucial. I want to um, return to this issue of the patents it is an ethical problem, isn't it, that you have some companies investing billions to develop something, a drug, and then it is produced at a very cheap price and distributed and potentially depriving these major pharmaceuticals of their revenue. I'm talking about those that do the research and development in, in, in Europe and, and the United States. But the point here is also related to the fact that there are lots of people who can't afford these expensive alternatives. So is that something the Indian uh, actors, both politicians, but also the pharmaceutical sector, have they been highlighting that kind of a ethical dilemma, appealing to the conscience of the world? And I know that the civil society organizations in India have played a critical role, have they not, in this whole debate, highlighting the fact that without the ability to produce these generic drugs, a lot of people would really be in, in deep trouble. That's right, Dan. I, so, I, to, I mean, to me, India is absolutely central to the whole global contestation over intellectual property, which one person I interviewed once in India, an activist who worked on this issue, basically very simply said, said to me that many people at in the 1980s and early 1990s, IP just sounded like a technical issue. And, and for those of us who, who work and uh, as, as researchers on development issues, I mean, there's whole other areas where labor rights issues, where democratic freedoms, other issues are gonna, they're gonna attract naturally a lot, lot more attention and students get interested in them and researchers do and there's this huge protests and mobilization around them. And this, this person I interviewed in India, really well regarded activists in that area basically just said well many in a sense people elsewhere thought ip was just a kind of boring issue it was kind of technical but india there was the really realization of how crucial uh, ip can be for its societal implications because and, and partly the india had started to develop this really thriving domestic pharmaceutical industry through the 1970s and 1980s and some actually identify the the lobbying movement from the United States through the pharmaceutical lobby and to some extent from Europe to actually put a global in agreement in place on intellectual property is actually motivated by trying to counter what was happening in India in the pharmaceutical industry amongst of course other pla other other places too so has India sort of led the kind of counter to try and maintain as much flexibility for what commonly can be called or are called developing countries in relation to intellectual property rights. It's of course faced huge pressure in that regard. And we still do have the TRIPS agreement. There was various timings that can be identified in terms of financial crisis in India and at the turn of the, the beginning of the 1990s where 
despite the strong resistance in India, there, there, this TRIPS agreement did come into place. But India is really central, I think, and the resistance in India and awareness from civil society domestically, as well as then, of course, uh, later working with international organizations, especially such as Medicine Sans Frontier, who, who sort of externally to the rest of the world helped highlight India's role as the pharmacy of the developing world. And I think we really have to mention the example and the issue of access to antiretroviral drugs for people living with HIV AIDS here, because this issue is one where India has been central to revolutionizing the global supply. The most prominent statement that is cited is when Yusuf Hamid, the head of CIPLA at the time, CIPLA, one of the major Indian pharmaceutical companies, 2001, he says he'll supply a year's supply of antiretroviral drugs for $300 a year. And at the time, they'd been about $10,000 a year in cost. And, and as, in a sense, antiretrovirals had been available to people in higher income countries, but not in lower and middle income countries. And if you look the country with the highest incidence of HIV AIDS in the world, South Africa. South Africa's life expectancy actually falls by almost a decade over the course of the decade, its um, first decade post end of apartheid. From the mid 1990s to the mid 2000s, South Africa's life expectancy actually falls from the mid, mid 60s to mid 50s. And uh, uh, very much related to the influence of uh, HIV AIDS. And now India is the biggest supplier of antiretroviral drugs to South Africa. South Africa's life expectancy is now higher again, I think, than it was at the time of the end of apartheid. And India is uh, become a major supplier to the Global Fund uh, for HIV, AIDS, TB and malaria to PEPFAR, the United S uh, States initiative. And uh, that's just within the scope of, of HIV AIDS. And it was one where, because there was no patent protection in place, had been, hadn't been any in place in India, that India had been able to develop this industry and to revolutionize the supply of this drug. So I think that is that sort of helps kind of really accelerate the awareness of and demonstrate the significance of IP and of India's pharma industry. That's fascinating, Rory. And we'll return to the international perspectives uh, slightly later in, in relation to India's impact abroad. But I want to continue with this focus on the domestic scene for the time being. And I've often wondered how important the pharmaceutical industry is considered within India. And I, you know, I grew up in India, my childhood, and uh, when I do return now, and I remember my, when my wife first visited India, she she remarked how, you know, she was fascinated with the, the sheer number of pharmacies that dotted a street. And you would have one street and there would be like five pharmacies. And, yeah. and it is in, in certain parts of India, mind you, an important part of daily life. And it's pretty easy to get hold of all kinds of medicines with or without a prescription. And some people wonder, that perhaps the controls are a bit lax and that you can get away with just calling yourself doctor and, and, and making a clear case that, you know, you know what, you, what kind of medicines you're taking. So while India is the superpower outside India, how is the pharmaceutical industry considered or viewed within India? Is it considered safe? Is it, is it considered to be doing good things in promoting health security? Is it, is it considered to simply be looking for profits? What, what is the kind of reputation of pharmaceutical companies within the country? So I'm, I'm obviously speaking as a, as a, a foreigner. I'm, I'm from Ireland, but I have spent quite a bit of time over the last more than 10 years uh, in India, and especially all, nearly all of that time researching the pharmaceutical industry. So I, I think the, the reputation of the industry is actually quite complicated within India, at least according to my observations. And one of the first examples I'd sort of point to, and in, in, in actually my understanding as I got into this research area was reading through Economic and Political Weekly, uh, incredibly uh, well known and widely read within India, but also uh, very well reputed outside India publication, which provides really great social science 
commentary on current social issues. I, I One of the early stages of my PhD research more than a decade ago was just basically downloading any article that had been in Economic Political Weekly and actually Social Scientist, another Indian publication, to see what had see what work had been done on the pharmaceutical industry. And I, I noticed that in the 1970s and 1980s, and this, this is long before the kind of patent issue becomes one of global contention, there's a lot of uh, health groups within India who are really raising a lot of question marks around the domestic pharmaceutical industry. These are related to pricing issues. There was a, there's long been contention around the extent of price control and also around companies' ways and mechanisms to, in a sense, get around the, the price controls that are in place. There, there's much less drugs under price control in India now than there were, but 1970, there was a huge amount of drugs under a drug price control order. There was a lot of question marks around some of the marketing practices of some of these companies. And there was also question marks domestically around the quality of some of the drugs available within the Indian market. And it's not just India where I've been, but in, in other places too, where people actually, uh, people will actually say they want the drug from the multinational, not from the domestically owned company. I think that's, I mean, that's that, that would have been more an issue, I think probably, in the past in India rather than a, a reflection now. And there, I mean, the other issue as well is there is an environmental aspect to the industry too, uh, which is not so positive. There is the, the Greater Hyderabad area has had in a sense a, a restriction or a ban on any further active pharmaceutical ingredient production of, for more than, a, for almost 20 years now. Uh, and very high levels of pollution have been found in were, were found in that area. And there's uh, so th there there are some in a sense darker sides to this industry. I think it's a very politically sensitive issue because at the same time India was needed a very for had a very important role to be held up as a kind of very positive example of what can happen when you don't have strong intellectual property rights in place and has enormous public health benefits uh, in other ways in terms of antiretroviral drugs and in other countries as, as we will talk about but domestically i think the the situation is is more complicated of course there's a lot of benefits uh, domestically to having a much greater pharma industry in india uh, the price of most drugs in india is significantly lower certainly significantly lower than it had been before this, when the industry was controlled by foreign multinationals in India, there was a U.S. Senate committee report in 1961, which said the price of drugs in India was amongst the highest in the world. That would be hard to believe for anybody who uh, spends any time in India today, where, where drugs are, uh, or anyway, drugs are very widely available and for the most part, relatively affordable, although there are some drugs that are very high priced now because of the new introduction of patent protection as a consequence of the WTO for some cancer medications and one or two other areas there. Sudip Chaudhuri, who is, to me, the leading researcher in the world on India's pharmaceutical industry, he's recently retired from IAM Calcutta, and he, he worked on India's pharmaceutical industry in the early 1980s and continued working on it for almost uh, four decades since. So he was there from the beginning, long before it attracted global attention. He's he's really talked about this quite quite extensively and it's in, in it's it's a very it's a very complicated issue. Somebody else that I it just springs to mind now has sort of talked about because of some of these potential downsides, in a sense, India is the pharmacy to the world, but not to India. But but it, but it is complicated because now we're we're likely to see India, at least compared to some other lower middle income countries actually having greater rates of initial rates of access to COVID vaccines because of Serum Institute of India in particular and the development of capabilities in this sector. So it's it's a mixed bag, but it's probably a mixed bag in many other places too. But it's, it's, it's not to say that, uh, to try and undermine the Indian pharmaceutical industry, just to point that there, I, I think, which is probably what you're, you might've been pointing to your question, there are sort of 
different kind of uh, reactions within India as well. You know, I was mentioning to you before we started the recording that we have a new research project that I'm heading here in Oslo, and we're collaborating with partners in Africa, but also in India, the University of Mumbai. We're studying India's soft power and this growing kind of very positive reputation that it has achieved in, in, in terms of medical tourism and, and access to medicines and healthcare and this kind of partnerships that a lot of NGOs in, on the African continent and governments, they're partnering with Indian actors and India's pharma exports are just, you know, expanding to Africa. And you, of course, mentioned the antiretroviral drugs and, and the important role that Indian ARVs have played on the African continent. I want to get back to this um, vaccine diplomacy that you mentioned, a medical diplomacy. I find it quite you know, fascinating. Last year when COVID was in its initial, um, there was a lot of talk about the mask diplomacy from China. And and now, of course, you also mentioned, you know, India has exported hydro, hydroxychloroquine to many parts of the world, paracetamol. All of this is positive, isn't it? I mean, I'm, this is not just important now for Indian companies in relation to making profits, but also for the Indian government to project itself and to position itself, of course, in relation to China. This is India-China rivalry, and India can't match China's infrastructure capacity or the, the, the capacity to build infrastructure on the African continent and many other parts of the world. But what India can and does very well is, of course, what they call often frugal innovation in terms of IT and but also in relation to health. So how, how do you see this playing out, this medical or vaccine diplomacy? And, and there are all kinds of challenges, and you may want to reflect on this application by India and South Africa. Was, well, was it the WTO? Was it a particular provision that they wanted a waiver? So just, you know, could you reflect a bit on the capacity that India has to distribute vaccines at an affordable rate to parts of the developing world? Yeah, I mean, in, so, I mean, India is the biggest supplier of, of, of vaccines in the world. And primarily, I mean, many vaccines are administered to, to children. So a lot of that is supplied through to UNICEF. Serum Institute of India is, is the leader in that and has sort of consult, developed that role over more than 20 years now. It's not the only big uh, Shanta Biotech, and there's other big vaccine producers in India as well, biological. The, and this, in a sense, is, I think, one of the most prominent and most influential examples of South-South relations in the world. The enormous influence of India in supplying medicines and vaccines. For the Indian government, this is definitely fits with the idea of win-win South-South cooperation. India has always been a leader in South-South relations and trying to promote the interests of the South. And there are clear industrial benefits from for India from this industry, but there's also clear uh, benefits for public health in other parts of the world. I think it's, it's, it's important to emphasize though that a lot of the exports from this industry aren't necessarily a direct product of kind of government to government cooperation agreements, at least before we're seeing those government government agreements in the pandemic. But there's a lot of people I've interviewed in Indian pharmaceutical firms who have talked about basically they made business connections in different parts of Africa. And of course, there are long-standing people of Indian descent in East Africa, especially, and also in South Africa, who they, they and essentially Gujarati business networks, which uh, across the Indian Ocean, which helped in a sense facilitate the, uh, in a sense, private sector exports of drugs from India to 
sub-Saharan Africa. So there, there are ways where different government policies, of course, India and in the support from the government initially in developing the industry through the state-owned companies, but, but many people involved in this export would really see a lot of it as a kind of private sector uh, trade. We're, we're seeing, uh, uh, but of course, from a diplomatic point of view, this, this makes sense as a really high, a be, positive aspect of South-South cooperation to highlight. And we're seeing enormous, the kind of vaccine diplomacy in a big, big way. There's a lot of talk about vaccine nationalism of providing vaccines to your own population before elsewhere. But I think we're also seeing mm -hmm. vaccine diplomacy, especially from both China and India, but also in a intriguing way, Russia too. And this is partly in a context where some of the initial vaccines that have been approved in Europe and North America for COVID-19, especially from Pfizer and Moderna, have restrictions in terms of the temperatures they need to be stored at. And also a lot of the doses have already been bought up in Europe and North America and very little manufacturing of them. I wanted to ask you about that, Rory, because one thing is, of course, to manufacture, produce the vaccines. The other thing would be the logistical problems of distribution and storage. One could argue that China is much better equipped to do that, right, in terms of the logistical capacity. But India, how do you see India actually distributing these vaccines? Well, that's where it varies depending on what the vaccine is. So that's where the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, for example, has been held up as a much more likely candidate as a vaccine for the world than the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines, which with both need to be, the, the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine can be stored in a regular uh, refrigerator. So, and, and in a sense, distributed in the same way that other, essentially what's important is that it can be distributed in the same way that other vaccines would be distributed. And there are long-standing mechanisms of regulatory approval and logistics distribution from India to other parts of the world, uh, including low and middle income countries where there's been enormous progress in vaccination over the last couple of decades. So I think that's where there are differences really important, but depending on what the, what the vaccine is, but yeah, China and India as well. Uh, and we're basically seeing that I think now there's a, a very difficult choice for many low and middle income countries or lack of choice in that some of the vaccines that are now being rolled out as we speak in Europe and North America either have already been bought up the initial supply or in addition are also very unsuitable for the conditions and logistical infrastructure that is available. So we're seeing increasingly turning to India, China and even Russia for COVID-19 vaccines because they're the, the and these countries are actually willing to to make them at least to some degree available and india signed a, a prominent deal last week with south africa to supply a million covid 19 vaccines of the oxford astrazeneca vaccine by the end of january another half million by february there's deals with bangladesh with nepal as well and and likely to be others too I think the first COVID-19 vaccine supplied to Argentina were the Sputnik V uh, vaccine. The first country in Africa where they're available, I think, was or any vaccines were administered was Guinea, I think, from the, also the Sputnik V vaccine. The Chinese one has had to undergo clinical trials in Brazil and other countries because of China's success in curbing the vaccine domestically. So there's enormous, really fascinating aspects of side-side relations, which are emerging in the context of COVID vaccines at the moment. A uh, final set of issues, Rory, has to do with this competition and the rivalry between India and China that we were discussing earlier. On the one hand, of course, I noticed that India is very dependent on China for, for access to active pharmaceutical ingredients, or the so-called APIs. And any shortage of, of supply from China for that would impact India's production capacity, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. So that's one kind of dependency that India has on China. There's also this other aspect of who to trust. So let's say in Africa and Asia, Latin America, 
there may be less trust on the the Russian vaccine and perhaps more on on India because of its reputation. Um, but I also noticed that the Chinese are, of course, using the vaccines as an important tool to cultivate closer relations. Just earlier today, I was I, I noticed on Twitter there were these pictures of the Indonesian president receiving the first jab of the of the Chinese vaccine. How do you see this kind of rivalry, the South-South rivalry between India and China, but also then with the other BRIC country, Russia, playing out in the world in relation to vaccines? So on the one hand, of course, you have all these Western uh, vaccines, and on the other, you have these, these cheaper variants that are most likely going to play an extremely important role in many, many parts of the world in the next few years. It's it's a really interesting question. I think we we're, we're we're still at the early stages of seeing exactly how it's going to play out. There there are a lot of deals that both China and India have done recently, and it is. I mean, even within South Asia and Southeast Asia, there's there's. I mean, some places there's sort of a division of labor between China and India, depending on which countries are more sort of friendly <laughs> friendly already. So I mean, it's. It's unlikely the Indian vaccine is going to be Indian produced vaccines are going to maybe well it's I'm not haven't seen so much yet about their availability in Pakistan but I think Chinese vaccines are likely to be available in Pakistan and Chinese vaccines are also likely to be uh, oh anyway there's deals in in uh, in China, in Indonesia and elsewhere in Southeast Asia too some countries are actually seem to be almost looking like in in their desperate search for vaccines they're going to look for vaccines from maybe even from india from china and from from, from russia all uh, all all three all, all three i think that's the case some some parts of uh latin america and many countries if they have the resources of trying to look for covid vaccines from from wherever they come from the nature of these deals i mean there's some broader discussions in relation to china's involvement elsewhere about the nature of the relationships i mean long standing really uh, important questions about the nature of relationships that come from assistance from from china it's uh, not something that's really been the the focus of my research but i think it, it will be interesting to see how that plays out in in this vaccine context too but i think it's still it's really early early days but there's no doubt that these south south relations are going to be incredibly key for any kind of meaningful covid-19 vaccine access in low and middle income countries it was great fun to chat with you today rory thank you so much for coming on my show oh well, th- thanks dan and good good to talk about pharmaceuticals and a lot of really Im- important issues hopefully and i think let's let's hope we see a lot of progress in access especially in the immediate future and for covid-19 vaccines If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the news among your friends and share it on social media. The Twitter handle for this podcast is Global Dev Pod. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.